All right, let's continue our programming by welcoming front office sports reporter Amanda Kristovich and ESPN host and basketball analyst Monica McNutt. Oh, Welcome, Monica. Already. Thank you so much for being here. Thank um, you. There are a lot of people who have teed you up already. Uh, your ears must have been burning. Mm -hmm, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we're going to start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, we've been on this panel for about 30 seconds, and I'm already going to bring up the fact that we both went to Georgetown. Yes, indeed. Um, I did not play basketball at Georgetown, like you did, obviously. Um, but tell us about the journey that you had from Georgetown basketball to sort of your rise, um, MSG Network, ESPN. Um, when I talk to other Georgetown alums in the media arena, they're always like, Monica's the star. Like, she's <laughs> our star. How'd you do it? Oh, man, I appreciate that compliment. Thank you, Amanda, for that question. Um, I want to use the word organic, and that would include all the smelly parts about organic, if <laughs> okay. I'm honest. Uh, at Georgetown, it was actually our media coordinator, our SID, our sports and information director, that was the first person that was like, Mon, you're great at these interviews. Like, you should explore this. And so that was hugely important. I always give Barb a shout out, Barbara Jonas, or Barbara Barnes, excuse me, a shout out whenever I have these conversations. But then from there, it was really slowly putting one foot in front of the other. And a huge part of my experience and my path is being able to advocate for yourself. Um, from Georgetown, I was a kindergarten aide and substitute teacher for a year at a DC public charter school. I went on to the University of Maryland where I got my graduate degree. But again, the University of Maryland opportunity comes about because I'm sitting at a table at a Washington Post event about a award ceremony for the all Met section and I'm sitting across from George Solomon. And I'm like, hey, my career's over. I'm trying to figure out the next thing. And he goes, well, you should come check out our graduate program. Um, and so that turns out to be an important moment in my arc. From there, I land a job in community television in Prince George's County, again, at an NABJ event. Uh, hey, I want to be a sports anchor in DC. Leon, oh gosh, what's Leon's last name? I'm blanking on it, but longtime anchor in DC turns to me, Leon Harris turns to me and says, you should meet this guy. It happened to be the news director at a local station who ended up giving me a job. Um, so there's all these touch points for me where I had to be vocal and willing to put myself out there. And then there was the layoffs, which were like a very important exercise in my art from separating who you are from what you do. Mm -hmm. um, but it also showed me, I mean, and don't get me wrong, I love what I do, I'm very fortunate. This is not the only thing. When it was taken from me, this is not the only thing. Did I certainly have the passion to get back to it? Yes, but there are other things that make me whole, and I think that's hugely important um, for all of us, but particularly as women. Anyway, long story short, get back after those layoffs, and again, it is about advocating. It's, hey, I'm trying to get to ESPN, hey, I'm trying to get to opportunities to call games and women's sports. Um, I can, I'm available, I'm interested. A ton of pitching, a ton of no's, mm. but you get a few yeses that matter. You get a phone call from uh, Pat Lowry at the time who was in charge of women's college basketball at ESPN. Mm -hmm. Can you be available on Saturday and it's Wednesday? And the answer is yes, yes. like you figure it out. Um, and then the domino started to fall. So it's been a combination of really advocating for myself, challenging myself and being willing to wear different hats that has gotten me here. Is there a moment in that journey, maybe the call with Pat, for example, where you sort of felt like this is, this is it, like this is the turning point, this is where the momentum really starts? Uh, so I had been at ACC Network for two years. The, was this in the pandemic or was this right, out, right before? Yeah, I think we're in Time's the pandemic. Time's a flat circle. Yeah, it's, girl, such a flat circle, what is time? We're in the pandemic and again, I want to clarify, though, yes, advocating for myself, but I've had tremendous support and people that are willing to advocate for me as well, and that's hugely important. But the college season ended. One of my good friends, Tori McMahon, is a producer at ESPN on SportsCenter. We had been talking about other opportunities at the company. She finally convinces um, some higher ups that I can handle doing SportsCenter hits at 7 a.m. talking <laughs> NBA. Okay. And I remember thinking, oh, March Madness is over. Like, we're about to chill. It's about to slow down. I did one hit on NBA for SportsCenter at 7 a.m., and then it just seemed like everything took off from there, right? Um, and so I do very much remember that moment because it's true. 
you don't have to get ready if you stay ready, right? And, or like you need to be prepared in order to have success. success. Success happens when preparation meets opportunity. And while that was something simple, and 7 a.m. is not as much a part of my routine anymore, <laughs> it truly was the moment that just kind of opened up eyes of folks at ESPN to this town that had been on the roster. Um, and so it was very important. And you, uh, I feel like one of, you've had a few viral moments recently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one, we're gonna get to the other one. But one of them was um, during the Knicks playoffs, you had like the camera next to you and you were you know, calling the game and it was like, I think like two minutes left in the game and you had so much like enthusiasm and like, you know, you were sort of like losing your mind <laughs> and then it came to be your second to speak and you took this deep breath and then you just like went into this extremely detailed analytical, you know, reaction to what had happened, bringing up different stats earlier, you know, how do you, maintain composure and like you said, how do you get ready to stay ready? Um, you have gotta trust your journey. And when I'm talking to young people, not even just young people, but my peers alike, you gotta trust your journey and that each season has something for you. Way backstory on that one. I called South Carolina, UConn, women's basketball when the two were the fresh one and two ranked teams in the country. Mm. I did that for Fox before I got to ESPN. Um, FS1 at the time, FS1 slash Fox. The game got tight late, it was a tremendous game. Down the stretch, I found myself enjoying the game but kind of slipping out of my analyst hat and I was just saying, wow, right? So my boyfriend, well now husband, and my dad brought this to my attention. And I'm like, but I said basketball things and they were like, yeah, you did, but like you also said wow a lot, right? <laughs> okay. So fast forward to that moment, 40 seconds ago, this crazy ending for the Knicks, I, in my head, I was like, wow. And I think I put in the caption, like, I had to snap out of it and remember that in this moment, as much as your heart is into it, you have to give some context of what's going on, particularly in radio, where people yeah. may have just turned the radio on or can't see. And so to some degree, developing composure is a byproduct of sometimes missteps and certainly your journey, because I literally hearken back to that moment, like, hey, like, you, you gotta remember to give something that is additive and not just be a super fan. One of my favorite things that you do is your March Madness coverage mm -hmm. um, on ESPN. Obviously, ESPN, um, I believe it was in January or February, uh, signed um, the Women's March Madness as well as, you know, couple dozen other properties um, for another several years. So you're gonna be on that train for a while. Um, how different does it feel, and, and you're sitting in a different seat, but how different does it feel from when you were at Georgetown? It's hugely different. I mean, first of all, the money that's being pumped into college sports and facilities and NIL, like, it's, it's completely different. But I can remember thinking, and I saw Sedona Prince at the ESPYs, and we had a chance to catch up a little bit. I can remember thinking as a college athlete, I'm gonna leave here with no debt and a degree. Like, mm -hmm. I'm happy to be here. Not right. that I wasn't competing, not that I was, wasn't trying to be great, but the disconnect between what the guys got and what the women got Every day you didn't necessarily have energy to fight it. And mm -hmm. I was one that was like, that doesn't make any sense. I've won more tournament games than they have in this four years. Like, <laughs> how come they get X, Y, Z and we don't? But at the end of it, I would say to myself, you're walking away debt free. You've had an incredible career. You've made incredible relationships. And so this generation of athlete, particularly when you think about Sedona Prince calling out the NCAA in 2021. Yes. You can be grateful and also expect and demand and ask for more. And so I think this generation of athlete compared to, and I, you know, I'm 2011, I graduated from Georgetown. It's not that long ago. I mean, whatever, I'm not trying it to go back. It was not long ago at all. Right. But I think this group, this generation of women can be both grateful and expect and demand more. And frankly, finally, the investment, the marketing, all of these other things that come into play in terms of keeping girls in sports and elevating the game have now come to the table. There have been a couple different takes about how NIL has impacted uh, women's sports athletes and specifically um, women's basketball players. Um, there have been you know, stats that NIL collectives are not servicing their female athletes the way they should, but on the other hand, female athletes are some, in some ways the best position to capitalize. And we are 
absolutely seeing that. Um, you know, which side of the spectrum do you land on on that debate based on what you've seen? And is there any athlete, you know, in the last year or so that you feel like has capitalized on NIL in a way that, like, you specifically wish you had? Or, you know, if you had the opportunity. Right. That's a loaded question, Amanda, because <laughs> I can remember, uh, at the time I had a podcast with my buddy Clinton Portis, as NIL was starting to percolate as a thing. Mm -hmm. And as a former pro athlete, obviously, he's like, money just changes everything. And my counter to that was, well, in the same way that we have folks that make sure grades are on point as student athletes, additional study hall, nutritionists, all these additional resources, give these student athletes the additional resource to support them navigating NIL, right? So I think for me, when you talk women's sports specifically, there is traditionally thought of, at least, of a smaller window. You've got this four years, maybe five, while you're in college to capitalize on whatever marketability you have, whatever fan base you're building, because there's only 144 spots in the WNBA if we just stick to basketball, right? Um, and so I think for women in particular, we've got to keep in mind that the Caitlin Clarks, the Angel Reese's, the Haley Van Lists, the Cameron Brink, they rec represent the top of the NIL conversation, and we're talking about all of the athletes Everybody. that have to take advantage of NIL, right? And so I think there should be some accountability for collectives. It's the same reason we have Title IX. Like, it can't all just go to football, who may be terrible in some cases, as opposed <laughs> to some of your uh, female athletes competing in other sports that may actually be achieving success on the collegiate level. And so there does need to be accountability and, and a conversation about the equality and the distribution of the collective resources. But I do think that it's a little bit of a different conversation for women athletes, partly because that loyalty there, now it's mainstream. Mm -hmm. But the folks that have loved women's sports, whether it be basketball, soccer, gymnastics, they are accustomed to following the sport to whatever ends of the earth they have to get to to watch and support. And that includes being able to make those meaningful connections with the athletes that they love. Do you feel like if we get to a place where college athletes are deemed employees or some iteration of that. Obviously, there are a lot of complications, different ways that this could go. What do you want to see for female athletes? Because a lot of people have said calling the athletes employees, um, you know, paying the football players, not playing the women, paying the women's basketball players, that's not going to be a good thing. Do you have a take on that? Uh, why is it not a good thing? Uh, you know what I mean? Like, the, it's, it's a two-way street. They are not asking, or the conversation is not a has not emerged about being paid mm -hmm. because they're just kicking it. Right. The athletes, as a collective, men and women, are bringing something to the institution that is valuable. I mean, two, what, two panels ago, Stephen A., like, value, hello, we can all talk value. And so I think, for me, the idea that institutions, colleges and universities have not benefited off of free labor for years. Like, we can't even argue about that. That's a fact, right? And so right. now to have the conversation about paying them, I'm here for it, frankly. Now, does it necessarily mean that it's going to be a negotiation that measures the amount of value that each individual brings? No, but in the NIL world, your stars are going to be taken care of anyway. We're talking about the folks that are fighting all their blood, 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 sweat, and tears and giving their tons of energies to be on rosters that may not have opportunities professionally. They still make similar, not even similar, they are still making the same commitment during their four years on a college campus. And the experience of a student athlete is very unique to the experience of a standard student. And so I think when we talk about paying athletes, people got to stop thinking about the first names that you see or that are currently in commercials. We're talking about the entire roster of athletes at universities. Sort of switching topics a, a little bit, but staying with women's college basketball. Um, one of my favorite debates is whether or not the Final Four should be combined. The NCAA has decided not to do that. Um, you know, obviously there are different rights holders for the men's and women's events. Do you think that combining them would be good for everybody? It's obviously this age-old question of, you know, does the women's sport have to, quote, ride the coattails of the men's sport? Should they be 
presented together like they are at the US Open, for example, mm -hmm. you know, or should they be split off so the women get their moment you know, in the spotlight? I am not for combining the Final Fours. I, I don't, again, as we talked about earlier, the following of women's sports, for them to potentially be pushed out because this thing has become a mass event, that makes my heart hurt. Mm. There's so much loyalty there. Um, and now, again, with the investment, the advertising, the mainstream of it all, it's growing. I think this year upcoming is gonna be a really pivotal year in the conversation around women's basketball and the NCAA tournament in particular. Mm. But I think you grow what you've already built. I don't think you necessarily have to merge the two. So I'm not for combining those. Gotcha. And when you say we are going, you know, this is going to be a pivotal year, what do you hope to see from ESPN specifically? I mean, there's been so much investment that they've put in. You know, they've done their own sort of version of the Manning cast, the Bird and Tarasi show, for example. Um, you know, what do you want to see more of? What, what ideas do you have about, you know, the network elevating its coverage to that next level? Well, I think the coverage of the tournament in and of itself is standard, spectacular, like built in, especially once you get to March. I think we as a company have the opportunity to help build the enthusiasm to March, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm thrilled at how much women's basketball has become a part of the mainstream conversation, the water cooler conversation. I'm not always thrilled with what I hear, but <laughs> sure. we have gotten to a place that we've clamored to get to in terms of being legitimate water cooler conversation. And so when I think of our March Madness coverage, I think in March and into April when you actually have the national championship game, it's fantastic. But what could the company do to support that, to help build enthusiasm throughout the, school, throughout the calendar year? Mm -hmm. And then also, uh, again, there are all these things that are happening in college sports that are sort of being thrown out as you know, things that are either good or bad for women's sports and women's basketball. Um, do you think that conference realignment is going to impact women's basketball in a positive way, negative way? You know, maybe not. Um, I've heard a lot of different perspectives on this because obviously it's driven by football. Mm -hmm. But what's your take on that? I hate conference realignment so bad. <laughs> <laughs> like I just hate it. I've hated it since. The original Spoken Big East like that a I true went Big East into. woman. Yeah, like, I, ugh, ugh. And I get it. It's the almighty dollar. It's understandable. But the other thing for me in conference realignment that I'm not sure is discussed enough, mm -hmm. and perhaps I'm a little bit outdated because of the experience coming off of COVID, what kind of life are you now creating for your student athlete experience? Right. Right? right. You're spending all your season time traveling across the country to these conferences that span the entire country, like, whoo. But, you know, if everybody's taking virtual classes, I guess it's fine, so. I mean, is everyone taking virtual I, classes? I didn't think so, but I okay. don't. I don't think so, Maybe, like, not at Georgetown. Certainly not at Georgetown, <laughs> no. <laughs> Certainly not at Georgetown. Um, so pivoting to the WNBA, um, let's talk about the other viral moment mm -hmm. um, that was sort of alluded to earlier. Um, a few months ago where, you know, you sort of called out Stephen A and ESPN for saying you could have started following the WNBA and women's basketball. You could have covered it the way you do now earlier, three years ago. Um, obviously, there was a bit of, you know, the firestorm <laughs> and Stephen A said he loves you and you said, and like, everything's fine from like a personal perspective, right? But like, what was it like to frankly, you know, not criticize in a, you know, in a, in a really visceral way, mm -hmm. but to critique your own network, because that's really rare. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing that a lot. Honestly, Amanda, <laughs> <laughs> the way that whole thing panned out to me, I was like shocked. I, I really, really thought I said water was wet. Yeah. It, this yeah. Is, it was not, um, and Stephen A and I, we are totally fine. It's a debate show, we debated. Right. As one of our leaders said, he's not the only person with strong opinions. Um, but for me, it, it, it wasn't disputable. Yeah. And perhaps maybe you, as opposed to saying ESPN, draws some, uh, crosses some feathers and gives people a little bit of an uproar. But three years ago, I mean, there are people internally texting me like, yeah, you're right, like less than 10% or yeah. less than 5%. Like, I've also heard you on broadcasts make 
comments about how Georgetown used to be a powerhouse and now they're not. So it's not like they're the only institution that yeah. you've been a part of that you criticize. A hundred percent. And so for me, I, that whole thing really blew my mind. But what I will say of it is I'm thrilled that we are here, right? Uh, I have so much respect for Stephen A. And while one of my good friends that's NPR is like, Mon, anytime you say respectfully, you're about to be disrespectful. <laughs> I genuinely was like, I know how hard you work. I know of your influence at this company. It was, you probably could have been a part of this as, as I see it from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Now he has said that he disagrees with uh, my stance on that. And that's fine. We, like he said, first take is not about holding hands and singing Kumbaya. Right. Um, but from where I sat, I was under the impression that you could have had impact in that way. If the response was, that's exactly our point on why Caitlin Clark is so important, mm -hmm. cool. Like, and I probably couldn't argue with that because the numbers would bear it out. But it really wasn't about, it wasn't supposed to be what it was. It was like, okay, <laughs> like three years ago, we weren't having this many conversations about women's basketball, and that's really not up for debate. <laughs> right, no, it, I mean, it was, it was a fact. Yeah. Um, and then the other aspect of that moment that interested me was what he said on his podcast after. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and perhaps you know, he revisited those comments today about saying, you know, I've had a lot of women on my show. I've really helped boost their, um, you know, the visibility. And you know, I sort of helped make their careers. I I'm paraphrasing, right? Mm -hmm. um, how did you hear that comment, and what you know? How did you react to that comment today, or the podcast? The on, podcast. On the podcast. Uh, you could do today too. Listen. Start with the podcast. Okay, the podcast. I, it wasn't my favorite thing, but I've sat across from Stephen A. and I know how diligent he is and how much he works. And if you listened, there's a flutter of compliments, and then there's this stuff One like it's thing. a little like yeah. ah, what? Huh? Right? Um, and so for me, I have grace as someone that is in television. You're not always gonna knock it out of the park. But I don't, I have no doubt that Stephen A, and I have seen and experienced his support, right? Um, I think at large though, there were a, a number of reasons why that moment goes viral in terms mm -hmm. of Molly and I, mostly me, Stephen A. Shannon, two powerhouses in the industry. Here I am trying to hold my own in this conversation. Like, there's, there's this woman calling out, calling out a company, calling out Stephen A. Like, there's so many layers to why that conversation had so much heat to it um, for the few days that it did. And then, of course, the actual topic of whether right. or not you believe that Caitlin Clark has experienced an extension, an, an extensional number, uh, amount rather, of hate through the league. Like, right. wherever you stand on that. So there were a lot of layers in that. But ultimately, I think it's a moment that people remember. I hope that you remember it as an opportunity to discuss women's sports more consistently as opposed to a fracas. Because we, I'm good at ESPN. It's football season right now. I don't have a reason to be on first take. Like, <laughs> he and I are good. I have tremendous respect for his work ethic, as many of you heard about all the things that he's building. Um, and I'm going on about my business. Like, WNBA playoffs start September 22nd. I'll be on the games. <laughs> so speaking of WNBA and those narratives, I mean, I would, I, I, I love, to ask about correcting the record. What are a couple narratives that either you're sick of talking about or you hear often about, you know, the WNBA wouldn't be where it is without Caitlin Clark, for example. Um, what are a couple of those narratives where you'd like to correct the record? So I've actually had to let that go a little bit <laughs> because I think- I'm sorry I'm bringing you back. No, 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 but, but I, it, it has been something that I've talked with friends, talked to myself, kind of reflected and read. Um, we've wanted the women's game to be elevated to this level for so long. Mm -hmm. And so if with all the new eyeballs comes some nonsense, okay, I have to just turn that one off and turn the one on that I subscribe to. And so I've had to work with that. I think for me though, again, this is a layered conversation. The makeup of the league is largely black women. Caitlin Clark happens to be a white woman. Mm -hmm. I think she's incredible. She's gonna be Rookie of the Year. And even folks that get into my mentions that are like, you said this, that, and the other. I, 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 I never said she wasn't The tremendous. Caitlin Clark fans have been measuring every single comment 100%. you've ever made about her. It's incredible. 100%. Yeah. I never said she wasn't tremendous. I did go by the standings early in the season based on my Rookie of the Year conversation. But it's so funny, people are like, you said Angel Reese was Rookie of the Year based on the standings. The day before, when Indiana was ahead, I had said that Caitlin was Rookie of the Year at that point, right? And so I think for me, 
I have to be reminded that the people that are coming to women's basketball, courtesy of a get up or a first take, are mm -hmm. not the same people that probably watched our WNBA countdown over the weekend leading into games. Right. It's two different audiences. And so I have to go into doing my job well, being cool with how I present, um, the information that I'm presenting based in facts, even if it's gonna be an opinion ultimately, let's start with a fact mm -hmm. and roll with it. And so um, one of the more disappointing narratives that has emerged this season is the disrespect for Cheryl Swoops. Mm. Um, that is very, very unfortunate. Yeah. Cheryl is an, a tremendous competitor, a winner, an Olympic champion, a four-time WNBA champion. She can say when a player is delightful and is incredible and has respect for that. But the other part too, and again, all these layers, we talked about Charles Barkley a bunch today. I have heard Charles Barkley hate on NBA players, <laughs> right? Like, why is it that right. women sometimes are not given the grace or told how to be and how to do every little thing. And I don't wanna, I'm not gonna go all the way there, but like I mean, you that can. part. Cause that, that was a conversation at the ESPNW Summit about why is it that a little bit of hazing, let's say, or mm -hmm. you know, or you know, not letting the rookie just waltz in. Why is it that for the WNBA, that is you know, a big controversy, whereas in any other men's league, that's expected. The idea that everybody laid out the red carpet for LeBron James when he got to the NBA, <laughs> like I know for a fact that did not happen. You know what I mean? And so I think you can compete, you can do all the things that fall into the parameters of competition. It's physical, it's hip chats, it's maybe it's, it's funny looks, right? Like within the basketball game, of course, within the rules. Right. But like this idea that it has to be kumbaya, I just, and frankly, Having watched Kaitlyn Clark's career, having watched her this season, she herself is a competitor. And so in that part of the conversation that women have to compete a certain way and it has to look a certain way has bothered me. And of course, I have tremendous respect for Cheryl Stoops. She's one of the reasons that I fell in love with the game of basketball. The WNBA also signed a new media deal that was part of the NBA media deal. Um, similar to the combined Final Fours question, do you have an opinion on you know, whether or not it is a good thing to have the NBA and WNBA products sold together? Should they be sold separately? Um, you know, again, ongoing debate, and there are some folks who are really excited about the WNBA's media deal. I mean, I think most people are, but then uh, there are some experts who say, oh, they could have gotten more. Um, what's your take? The WNBA is literally 50 years younger than the NBA. Like, right? So mm -hmm. on its face, I don't have an issue with the deals being together. I think sometimes for some of us that are in these verticals, we are in women's sports, we are in sports at large, you feel like there's progress and sometimes you gotta step back, right? You can't see the forest for looking at your particular tree. I still am okay with those deals being connected. Um, the WBA, the next upcoming deal is the biggest that it's had. It's the most um, partnerships in terms of opportunities for fans to check out games that it's had. Uh, and you, I still think of a handful of owners that are pushing the envelope in terms of elevating the product to help turn revenue. But frankly, Commissioner Kathy Engelbert has to be mindful of all of the owners. Mm -hmm. And every owner is not Mark Davis, is not the size in Brooklyn, it's not um, uh, Ishbia in Phoenix or the new ownership group that's coming in for the Warriors, right? or no, excuse me, not the Warriors, the Valkyries, I apologize, the Golden State uh, organization, or Seattle, they just got a new facility as well. And mm -hmm. so I still think that the WBA is working to find its way to stand on an entity as its own. But I also, even from my personal experience, allyship is not a bad thing. Right. Right, and so I, I, just, I choose to look at it from an opportunity to, con to continue to empower the league, to continue to grow. Um, and right now I'm cool with the package deal. Awesome. All right, so we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, back to you. So you have WNBA playoffs, um, women's college basketball, which I'm most excited about as a college sports reporter, um, you know, Knicks. Beyond that, like, what's on your wish list? What's next for you? Oh, man. Um, I love voiceover work. Ooh. So like the big wish list, a slightly detour from sports would definitely okay. be to do some sort of like animated voiceover work. I think that's so much fun. Or even not just animated, like audible, that kind of thing. Um, 
I just sometimes don't want to see a screen. And like, you just want to hear mm -hmm. the story told, the richness of the storyteller, the, the sound of a story. And then, of course, the other side, animation is absolutely a screen. But that's kind of sort of wish list fun project um, to keep the other sides of your brain, the creative juices flowing. Is that like kind of like almost the radio in you? Yeah, that's part you? of the reason why I love radio. Like, I just think you could tell such a great story through audio mediums minus the screen sometimes. Awesome. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank Everyone, you, please Amanda. Give a round of Thank you, guys.